Good evening. Good evening. Welcome very, very much to Conversations, where I'm very pleased to be at a conference of the uh, Socialist Scholars Conference, which is subtitled this year, Two Centuries of Revolution, commemorating the uh, uh, French Revolution of 1789, and it's being hosted here in, the, in, uh, in Manhattan at the Manhattan Community College uh, in Manhattan, and they have a, a host of socialist uh, uh, scholars uh, attending. It's a major event, seventh anniversary event, as I understand program with an interview with the chancellor of, uh, of the City University of New York, and that is Joseph Murphy. And Joseph Murphy, welcome very, very, very much to Conversations. This has become an annual affair, or it has become associated with, uh, with uh, the City University of New York, the Socialist Convention Conference. You brought together a tremendous array of uh, social critique and so forth at this conference. It serves well the scholarly community and, and uh, the City of New York. I'd like to take credit for it. Truth of the matter is that it's been independently organized with many uh, different organizations expressing their support for this conference, and it now, I believe, is in its seventh or eighth year. Uh, I suppose its linkage with the City University of New York is twofold. First, because it occurs in one of our facilities, but perhaps more importantly, uh, a large number of our faculty have been involved in the uh, organization of the conference. Uh, and many of them uh, reflect, I suppose, the political, social, and ideological views that are uh, best described as democratic socialist, socialist, and in some cases even well to the left of that. Mm -hmm. But it does appear now to have become, uh, so far as I know, the single uh, most important, certainly best attended uh, conference representing the American intellectual left uh, that occurs in the United States. If there are others, I don't know of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result, uh, people have now begun to associate uh, this conference with a good uh, deal of the activity uh, of our uh, faculty who are involved. I think the thing that surprises me more than anything else is the representation of publishers, mm -hmm. mainline publishers, who are now uh, extremely active in the publication of uh, socialist work uh, and um, uh, political work identified with the political left in the United States. My suspicion is that a good deal of the energy and the interest uh, that occurs today is at least partly the result of Perestroika and Glasnost Interesting, yeah. and the whole opening. Uh, I should say it's the Soviet Union's opening to the world yeah. rather than our opening to the yeah. Soviet Union. It's a breath of fresh air. And yeah. it has uh, been, I think, a source of amazement to some of us that uh, what had been an intransigent political standoff for so long has suddenly uh, watched uh, these walls of separation melt like an ice cream cone in an August sun. Mm. Uh, it's just it, it's just startling to me. Well, having come out of a presidential election where the word liberal became associated as a quote-unquote dirty word, it might be well if we could start melting some of our uh, more uh, reactionary stance, which has been too characteristic of the American position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, at least, and certainly many of the people here at this conference feel that way, and if you understand what I'm saying, something that could echo uh, what uh, Mr. Uh, Gorbachev is attempting to do. Well, and, uh, the Soviet Union. it is. It is. It is still. It seems to me too early to know exactly what is happening. Uh, what is happening is very startling, and it's going to take some time for us to 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 uh, digest intellectually uh, the meaning. This uh, very complicated series of events that have occurred in the Soviet Union. Uh, some time ago, people were inclined to believe that if. Uh, any rapprochement could be established or detente between the United States and the Soviet Union. It might entail, to some degree at any rate, uh, a larger uh, commitment on the part of America to greater redistribution of its wealth and the attendant uh, elimination of poverty uh, and the hopes for a real uh, welfare state on the one hand, and on the other, an opening toward uh, political democracy uh, among the Soviet Union. Um, and that w our societies would gradually over time begin to look more like each other uh, than they look unlike each other. Mm -hmm. Now, 
my guess is, is that we've not moved in the direction of the creation of a welfare state. In fact, the last eight years have witnessed the disintegration of what we did have in the way of a welfare state. The Reagan years have yet to be paid for by all of us, but those Reagan years are clearly being paid for by the poor people in America, by minorities, by working class people, and so on. And by many of our more socially responsible institutions. Isn't That's it? for sure, mm -hmm. including, including major public universities that are watching uh, their uh, tax dollars, the tax dollars that normally go to nourish them, uh, n not produced. Mm -hmm. um, that is to say, far too much of our wealth being in the hands and pockets of the very wealthy and far too little in the public commonwealth. It has common become wheel. tremendously concentrated. Ravi Batra says 36% of all wealth now is held by the upper 1%. And the tendency is in that direction. It's interesting, that's the same proportion of wealth ownership that occurred in 1929. And of course, he writes, we may be heading for a gigantic, uh, something more than a recession. But well, there are those who believe that that's the case. Uh, part of the problem of concentrating wealth in the hands of relative few is that the rest don't have the money to buy the objects and goods that are produced by those who have a uh, desire to make profit mm -hmm. uh, and, and invest money with the hope of selling goods produced. So. The dislocation that's likely to be occurring right now in our own society may lead to consequences of a very dramatic nature for which we really have no easy prescriptions or answers yet. Mm -hmm. But to watch the Soviets in the direct going in the direction of political freedom is and, and to watch them doing it with such startling rapidity, I must say, is among the more revolutionary events, which I know was a source of discussion among socialists at our conference today. Sure, it would be. Spigiev Brzezinski has a book out now saying that this reflects the fact that the socialist experiment is a failure and that capitalism will live forever. <laughs> there are many people taking that position in the West, you know, might through st peace right. through strength. And well, you know, that, most uh, of the socialists very, at this... Of arrogance yeah. on the part of the people. Most of the socialists at this conference don't believe that socialism was ever tried. Yeah, uh, right. Most of them are, after all, democratic socialists who believe that socialism is a principle of the distribution of wealth mm -hmm. and can only exist in a democratic society. Mm -hmm. uh, Brzezinski's uh, intellectual powers have never been considerable mm -hmm. and uh, they are on this subject even more uh, misguided and misleading uh, than uh, what we've normally uh, come to associate with mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to argue that what we have is uh, a capitalist society is to argue also uh, that it has uh, been able to survive only so long as it's been held in restraint. Mm -hmm. We have yet to find out whether it can survive uh, in its present uh, uh, form, which is apparently without constraint. Mm -hmm. One wonders if there is a chance of a recession or worse, if some people are predicting, some people are feeling, even many uh, people in economic analysis are saying there could be a recession or worse, what that would bode in terms of the complacency of so many of the American people toward uh, broad social issues and so forth that are brought into focus at this conference, if there were a, uh, a real economic downturn, the whole dialectic and sense of the broad mass of the American people thinking of, uh, of a fundamental radical or fundamental alternative might, uh, might expand. It might be a climate. Well, there are people who have argued this way. Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., for example, yeah. who really still continues in my mind to personify the liberal left has argued that the pendulum has to swing back toward uh, the other uh, more liberal um, uh, uh, pathway mm -hmm. as a consequence of uh, uh, what he believes will be very dramatic economic price to be paid for the excesses of the past decade. Um, all the numbers are bad, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, from foreign debt to to uh, the failure of SNLs, uh, yeah. to our domestic deficits. Um, there's, there's nothing that looks terrific. Uh, but on the other hand, there are other things occurring that have never occurred before. The globalization of the economy, for example, the very swift growth of technology. Um, uh, all this uh, constitutes new, new forces, and, and no one knows quite how to factor them into what's been going on internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, my own guess is, is that Schlesinger is probably right about the fact that we're in for some very hard economic times. He's wrong if he assumes that there is an automatic mechanism uh, and inevitability to watching the pendulum swing back to a welfare state. 
uh, or to a greater democratization or to a greater uh, equalization in the distribution of goods uh, and ultimately in democratic power. Uh, that is not what necessarily happens. I mean, the experience of Europeans has not been that. European societies have gone to the right and stayed on the right, mm. gone to the ultra-right, become fascist societies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, of course, uh, is as much a possibility as the other. And now it hasn't happened in America yet, although it could. Mm -hmm. And um, my own sense is that uh, since I'm not uh, a believer in inevitability, and mm. I believe human beings do, in fact, control history, and and have the power and the capacity uh, to, especially in democratic societies, to alter uh, historical developments, uh, that we have the capacity, it seems to me, to, um, to change the future, form the future, shape the future. That, uh, that, um, that outcome is very much in our hands. And the institutions that exist now, enabling us uh, to be able to make the future a brighter and better time for all human beings is possible as well. This mm. university is one. Yeah. My university, I think, has done more than any institution in America and certainly in New York to contribute to the development of, an, uh, of a very uh, varied and rich black and Hispanic middle class. Amen. Yes, indeed. And um, you ought to be, if I may say so, as a citizen, better and perhaps well supported by the citizens and the political leaders of the state than uh, currently they seem to be uh, want to do. We agree with that mm -hmm. wholeheartedly. You have a real problem, you have a particular budget. We do. This year has been the worst budget my university has had in the last decade, um, last eight years. Eight years. Uh, and um, partly the result of uh, structural difficulties and partly the result of, uh, of uh, tax cuts that were excessive. Uh, the idea that we ought to be involved in some sort of competition with other states to create a more favorable business climate by reducing taxes means that we're in competition with other states to pay less and less for public institutions, uh -huh. and it means that our people collectively, who are dependent on those institutions, suffer. Mm -hmm. uh, and my own university is a case in point. And I'm hopeful that the uh, political powers. Uh, t right now, uh, the ball is in the court of uh, the Assembly and the Senate, but certainly in the Assembly, which is a, a democratic body and has been elected, uh, uh, has seen as, as among its principal constituents, the City University of New York will mm -hmm. bail us out. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that the onslaught against working class people uh, in our country and in the city uh, is continued in the onslaught against their prospects for getting a higher education in the city university. Yeah, and it's something that ought to be reversed in terms of the, uh, you know, the prospects for this nation. We really do need to open up some way of relating, not only to the, let's say, poor, underclass peoples of our own nation, but even in a very real and larger sense, to the peoples of the world. We need vision that can allow us to relate to these people if we expect to maintain a national vision that would, or a vision that would ring true or resonate to the international community. That's something that we really do need. Well, things and have this certainly... this perhaps uh, is gestating some of the ideas that could be relevant to that. Well, it's, it's interesting, and um, my hope is that the conference will be a c part of a larger uh, effort uh, to get people to thinking about what the limitations of our policies have been in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, Thirty years ago, development was a major concept in our rhetoric, and we looked to assist in the development of the third world. Thirty years later, the third world is hungrier and, yeah. and more impoverished than it was then. And relative. we seem even more adrift at having policy, as the United States, to have policy that re does relate to the underclasses or to the campesino than we perhaps ever have. Uh, well, we, we certainly we have greater... We well, but we seem not to be able to resonate with the uh, aspirations of the broad masses of the underclasses, particularly of the third world, and then it's reflected in the fact that we can't do it very well even to the people within our own society they are less advantaged. We have failed, clearly, to, uh, to, to take the um, productions of our technology and our invention and innovation uh, and ability to produce vast amounts of goods uh, and to make them available to larger numbers of people until we see the, the uh, greater disparity in wealth and poverty in the world from third world countries to the major industrial countries as well as within those countries mm -hmm. and especially in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, you do not uh, encounter um, uh, quite as much in the way of misery uh, and poverty in some European countries as you do in others. Mm -hmm. I think London and New York are among the, uh, uh, leaving aside the Belfasts of the world. Mm. Uh, but London and New York are pretty, pretty dismal places, and I believe this is due 
uh, in large measure to the Reagans and the Thatchers. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it's interesting to see that those European countries with strong social welfare uh, states uh, are uh, providing more in the way of uh, support for their people uh, than we are. Mm. The Germans, for example, the Italians, uh, the Japanese, of course, um, and others, Scandinavian countries traditionally. We're seeing now tremendous renaissance of ideas and energy in places like Spain that uh -huh. have been uh -huh. locked down for a long time. Uh -huh. um, and we're going to have to look to ourselves and uh, to, to try to rectify this attitude toward a welfare state as being the sort of bought, bought on, on the bargain shelf. Yeah, we're right, going to have right, to spend right. more for our people. Right. Yeah, absolutely. We have to do that and find some alternate ways. We have to get some... The wealth is so concentrated, the ownership of it now, the assets of our economy are so concentrated, few hands, we want to try and get some... Uh, ownership distributed out, perhaps, or ways of getting some just distribution of income. You have a you have a program yourself. It's on, on uh, you have a channel here in New York City, and you're a well, television host yourself. And I wanted to perhaps congratulate you on the quality of many of the conversations that you've had on your conversations series. It's a good you. way to reach out to people through the use of the television. And the channel that you that uh, City University of New York has is an important vehicle for getting ideas out and about. Oh, we'd like to think so. Thank yeah. you for saying so. No, not at all. It's true. And this would be a way for uh, people to be aware of that, that you're doing that more or less on a regular basis, talking with Bob Lecatch and other kinds of people that you've done interviews. Do you do that on a regular basis, if I may ask? Well, it's, uh, it's intended to be on a regular basis, yeah. but occasionally we miss. We've just done a program um, on the situation in Northern Ireland. Uh, we had uh, Claire Short, uh, who's a member of parliament here, in, and I believe she's at this conference, mm -hmm. who organized the movement called Time to Go, which uh -huh. is an effort to get the British Army out of Northern Ireland, yeah. out of Belfast. Uh -huh. uh, and um, uh, she was, I think, a very interesting and very important and uh, exciting, uh, gave us exciting insights uh, into the economic and social conditions of people in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it's a good way. It's a good outreach, isn't thanks. it, for educational thinking? You certainly have a you certainly have an incredible rich faculty associated with the with the City University of New York and a rich tradition and I only want to just wish you all the very very best that you can and uh, hope that the public the citizens of the state might come to better support for education than the, perhaps they've been able to do or are doing up to the moment. Thank you for having me. I really want to thank you very much for participating thank here in conversations and for also for sponsoring this uh, for this, conve this convention and again I would remind you in the tele in the cable television audience it's been your pleasure to have perceptions of uh, Joseph Murphy's Chancellor of the City University of New York host institution for this incredibly exciting uh, uh, in, indeed, the exciting uh, conference, the seventh annual Socialist Scholars Conference, and we'll be coming back with more from the conference momentarily. We'd ask you to stay tuned for that. Uh, thank you very much once again, Mr. Uh, Murphy, and please do stay tuned. We'll Welcome back. Welcome back to Conversations, where we're pleased to welcome to the program now Philip Agee. Welcome to Conversations. Welcome back to the United States, if I may <laughs> say so. Thank you very much. And Philip Agee, of course, is an ex-CIA uh, agent or a person involved with the CIA who's seen the light and changed his view of things and got into considerable personal difficulty with the United States over the years. And I wonder if maybe you could, Philip, just for some of the people who might not be directly familiar with it, your history. You were a member of the CIA. You were working as a CIA uh, operative and so forth. But maybe uh, yes. share your own history, your own personal background. Well, it uh, it goes back quite some years now. Um, I was finishing my undergraduate studies at the University of Notre Dame mm. in 1956 when the CIA came around and asked me if they would, if I would uh, go into what they considered to be their most important training program, the way they would bring in the future executive leadership of the agency. And as I was going on to study law at that moment, uh, I rejected the recruitment approach. But then uh, about a year later, I was about to be drafted. It was when we still had compulsory military services. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so I uh, wrote off to the CIA because they had told me that if I hadn't done my military service, I could do it within this training program. And so uh, I wrote back, um, and six months later, I was in the CIA. Uh -huh. And they sent me off to military training, basic training, and then officer candidate school. I was commissioned a second lieutenant, worked for a year as an intelligence officer in the Air Force, and then was transferred back to Washington. Went through the year-long training program there, and uh, by the end of 1960, before 
1960 was out, uh, at age 25, I was down in South America running secret operations as a CIA officer undercover as a U.S. diplomat in the U.S. Embassy. Having received a fairly good education in the process and the standards and the rigorous standards that they set, or? You know, that's Am I correct? You think in terms of the Foreign Services being a very high calling, and you think of other services, but the quality of the people that they bring to that CIA activity, is it a high calling? Is it something Well, like I would say in terms of the background and the conventional, and conventional education, uh, certainly very high. They took in about 50 to 55 people a year mm -hmm. for this training program. Yeah, that's and that's not very many. Not at all. And uh, uh, the problem was that I left university with an honors degree in philosophy, yeah. but with no education. Okay. No political education yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And I didn't get a political education until I got down to Latin America. Uh -huh. And I saw the realities of the situation down there. And little by little I came to understand that the things that I were do was doing uh, was not really uh, in the security interests of the United States. Rather, they were there for, or we were doing all these things for stability. Uh -huh. And here I'm talking about propping up friends, political parties, uh, interfering in elections, establishing trade unions, putting out literature of all sorts of funding radio stations, uh, all of what is known as covert action operations. Yeah, uh -huh. And um, these are all based on the collection of intelligence, and then you use the intelligence to uh, try to manipulate events in a foreign country. Uh -huh. the, res the end result was that we were seeking stability by propping up the traditional ruling classes of uh -huh. those countries, uh -huh. meaning what they call down there the oligarchies. Yeah, These sure. are the few families that over the many generations have been able to corner most of the wealth and income yeah. and the land uh -huh. in those countries. And so I gradually turned against the work and eventually after uh, eight years in Latin America quit. Uh -huh. But at that time, it was 1968 by then, right. I had no intention of writing a book. Uh -huh. I was simply going to stay in Mexico um, and start a new life. Yes. I went to work with the company uh, there, people I had met uh, already when I was in the CIA, and uh, I also re-enrolled in university. I went into a doctoral program in the National University of Mexico right. on Latin American history and culture and so forth. I thought maybe I might come back to the States to teach at one point. But about a year or year and a half after I had left the CIA, all those old pressures of secrecy and discipline and uh, security consciousness had begun to fade away. Yeah. And as they faded, I began to think what had previously been unthinkable, mm -hmm. and no one had ever done it before, that is to write a book about how the CIA operates abroad. Yeah. All the different types of operations, but with real operations. I'm yes, describing right, what right. I and this my colleagues have been doing. Stuff. Yeah, right. yes. uh -huh. Well, I tried to start that book in Mexico, <clears throat> and I couldn't get the documentation I needed because I didn't have all everything in my memory. Yeah. So, uh, to make a long story short, I left Mexico, went to Paris, then went on to London, and five years after I started, I had the book finished. Mm -hmm. And that is the book which is uh, known as Inside the Company, yes, CIA right. Diary. Yes, right. It was first published in Britain in order to avoid censorship in the States, mm -hmm. and then it came out in, I think, now 29 languages. Yeah, amazing. <coughs> and what year did that come out then? First came out in 1975, uh -huh. and it's now, st it's still coming out. Too. Yeah, it's still coming out, and it's yes. still a, a box of that because you're showing that. I wonder if we could back up a little bit. One goes to the CIA, and you think of uh, many friends I have, or friends and acquaintances or what, who had worked with the OSS in the Second War, and the growth of the intelligence capability of the United States, which Many of the people feel they were serving good purpose. Well, they were involved in that. Yes. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? And intelligence is important. Government need information and so forth. When, if we have, did something change that put the United States into a position which seems now to be using uh, covert action, um, this kind of intelligence gathering, to only prop up oligarchy governments? When did the United States go wrong if they did? And why did the covert action and the, the work of the CIA become so important in terms of our foreign policy uh, initiatives and view of the world in your estimation? Mm -hmm. If you understand the transition yes, to it's see between uh, it's the end of the Second War and <clears throat> that kind of thing. Yes, it's, it's easy. We could talk about this for hours, you mm -hmm. know. But uh, I think it really, if you want to put your finger on a particular moment, it's the passage of the National Security Act of 1947, mm -hmm. which 
began the establishment, <coughs> excuse me, was the, uh, signals the establishment of the national security state mm -hmm. in this country. And it grows out of economic problems after World War II, which were anticipated even before the war was over, which led to the Marshall Plan for Reconstruction of Western Europe, which was unsuccessful. And most people think the Marshall Plan was a great success. In fact, it was a failure. Mm -hmm. And it required the military option taken in 1950 to remilitarize both the United States and Western Europe with West Germany and the other NATO countries, but especially West Germany as the hub. Uh, it was a so-called dollar gap period in which there weren't enough dollars in Western Europe to buy exports from the United States to prop up the economy here. You said the Marshall Plan was a failure. The, it was most indeed a failure. Most people did not see it that No, way. no, most people, the common uh, uh, interpretation is there was great success. And I probably would have thought it was a great success well, until you mentioned I it. Well, I can, I yeah. can uh, refer to you, you to some very interesting studies. Among others, the classic book which came out uh, in the late 60s about, uh, about this period, mm -hmm. which is called The Limits of Power. It's written by Gabriel and Joyce Colco. Uh -huh. They are professors in Canada. And uh, it uh, is the story of the first 10 years. And they explode all these myths like the, um, the Marshall Plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, in any case, the decision was taken in 1950 to increase the military budget many times over. And it got us on a national security militaristic footing. The CIA was part of that. Mm -hmm. And the CIA, from the very beginning, was not used just to collect intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's what one feels that an intelligence service should do. Yeah. Collect information, process the information, and then present it to the policymakers like the President, yeah. the Secretary of State, mm -hmm. Secretary of Defense, for mm -hmm. their decisions. Yeah, but they got <coughs> doing policy things that are setting policy themselves and carrying it out. Well, in actual yeah. fact, at the very first meeting of the National Security Council in 1947, after the bill was passed and signed by Truman, and Truman was in the chair at this meeting, the decision was taken to set aside $10 million for secret CIA intervention in the upcoming Italian elections, uh -huh. which were scheduled for April 1948. Mm -hmm. Ten million dollars, a huge amount of money Indeed. in those days. Yeah. And this money was set aside because there was fear that a left-wing coalition of socialists, communists, and others would win the first elections in Italy after liberation in 1944 yes. from fascism. Uh -huh. The reason was that these political forces had been the backbone of the resistance to more than 20 years of fascism yes. in Italy. Right. All right. And so they came out of the war very strong. Yes. Uh -huh. And the fear was that they might win these first elections. Uh -huh. So the money was passed out, these $10 million, through front organizations in Italy, through the Vatican, through Italian-American organizations in this country. And the result was that the Christian Democrats, that is the far right, uh -huh. the conservatives, won the elections. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't the end of it. Over the next 30 years, more than $100 million went to the Christian Democratic Party of Italy. Just Italy in Italy alone. To right? keep them in power, mm -hmm. exactly. So the, the die was cast in terms of... Exactly. As late as 1976, President Ford approved 6 or $8 million to the Christian Democrats for the elections that were scheduled for June of 1976. Mm -hmm. So you see, it's a continuing thing. Yeah. And it wasn't just Italy, but it, the, the euphoria after the 1948 election operation in Italy led to the creation of the bureaucratic structure mm -hmm. to repeat this all over the world. And I myself was involved in, in Latin America. Yeah, you were one of those that had been recruited to carry this out. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is what you have the CIA doing from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And I am very strong about, or feel strongly about the point that the United States needs an intelligence service. Mm -hmm. okay. But the United States, we need an intelligence service that keeps the peace, not one that is used to wage terrorist war against defenseless peasants in Central America. And that is the way the Reagan administration, and now the Bush administration is threatening to continue, has been using the CIA, but it's not anything new to them. Mm -hmm. Because also starting in 1947, there were paramilitary operations against every country of Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. They were the contras of that period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolute failure. Mm -hmm. Those operations went on from at least from 1947 until 1955. Mm -hmm. And not one of them succeeded because the U.S. side, the forces that we recruited, trained, and dispatched were like the contras. They had <clears throat> absolutely no political base. Mm -hmm. They had no popularity. The people in the late 40s and early 50s had served in the Nazi puppet regimes of the occupied countries of Eastern Europe during World War II. All right, yeah. And with the retreat of the, Soviet, of the uh, German forces, these people came with the Germans, mm -hmm. and they ended up after the war in displaced persons camps, yeah, right, many right, of them. Right, right, right. And that's where the CIA screened them 
selected them, recruited them, trained them, and then dispatched them through the so-called black overflights or mm. maritime infiltrations mm. to try to carry out sabotage, terrorism, foment rebellion, that kind of thing, just like the Contras have been doing in the 1980s yeah. in Nicaragua. Without so back. all of these things begin at the beginning, back in the 1940s, uh -huh. and they are continuous yeah. and all 42 years of the existence of the CIA. Right, yeah. So you have the attempt to penetrate and manipulate the institutions of power of other countries through covert interventions, cover, known as covert action yes, operations right. or right. special activities. Mm -hmm. And this is the subversion, really, of so-called pluralistic democratic institutions, because obviously, to the degree that a foreign political party or a trade union or a media institution like a newspaper are controlled by foreign power, i.e. the CIA mm -hmm. and the United States, to that degree they're not free at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's all done with money and with people who've been corrupted, paid salaries and so forth. And that, that influence is becoming and growing stronger all the time around the world in the third world countries of the world? That has been the attempt. Mm -hmm. The goal has been control. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. Control is a word that every CIA trainee learns very early on. Mm -hmm. It means long-range control of the natural resources, of the labor, and of the markets of foreign countries for the benefit of United States multinational corporations. That's what it comes down to. And that is defined as the national <coughs> interest. That's defined as the national interest, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. In order to affect this control, mm -hmm. it takes a lot of political repression. Mm -hmm. Because not only are there these operations to influence elections, or to collect information, or to establish trade unions, or influence the media, even to control it, to, to, to finance it, to mm -hmm. establish newspapers, for example, mm -hmm. or magazines. Mm -hmm. But there is what are known as liaison operations. Mm -hmm. This is a form of counterintelligence in which the CIA works with other foreign intelligence and security services all over the world. Mm -hmm. It started with the British right after World War II, but it expanded all over the world, and the CIA set up subsidiary intelligence services all over the world, beginning, for example, in, Gre in Greece. You know, the civil war that raged in Greece from 1947 to 1949, mm -hmm. we, the United States, intervened militarily mm -hmm. on the side of the far right in Greece, mm -hmm. which won the war, and in the aftermath, the CIA set up the KYP, mm -hmm. or KEEP, mm -hmm. KYP being the Greek initials for Central Intelligence Agency. All they right. just gave it the same name. Yeah, yeah. And this was the instrument for political repression and control in Greece for many, many years to come, mm -hmm. leading up to the fascist coup in Greece in 1967, mm -hmm. when the liaison officer of the KEEP, KYP, with the CIA station in Athens, became the leader of the military junta. His name was Colonel George Papadopoulos. Yes, right. right and right. Uh, he was the liaison contact with, uh, or principal liaison contact, meaning he was paid a salary, no doubt, by the CIA. Uh -huh. Well, they set up the Korean Central Intelligence Agency. And to this day, although it has a different name, this has been the institution for political control and repression in South Korea. Uh -huh. And I could go around yeah, the world right, giving right you examples. The world but today, you can be sure, as sure of this as you are of your own name, that the CIA is working every day, round the clock, with the murderous security and intelligence services of El Salvador, mm -hmm. which are the same as the death squads, mm -hmm. which have wiped out more than 70,000 people since the U.S. program began yes, in Sirius mm -hmm. in 1981. Yeah, right. 70,000 people, and this is one of the principal elements of any counterinsurgency uh, counter operation. You know that they've been getting more than a million and a half dollars a day. Mm. In these eight years, they've gotten three and a half billion dollars. Yeah, right. The CIA put millions of dollars into the uh, electoral campaign in 1984 to get Duarte elected, mm -hmm. which they succeeded in doing. Mm. And the work with the security services in El Salvador is one of the grisliest activities in our day right now. Yeah. All, the course, while we're, all the while we're preaching anti-terrorism and so forth, where some of well, the of course, but biggest we're terrorist fomenting, operations in the world are We're being fomenting up. state terrorism all over the place. How has it been? We had a revolutionary tradition in the United States. We came out of the Second War and into the anti-colonial era without perhaps the same baggage that many of the European countries did vis-a-vis -vis the colonized world and so forth. There was a good deal of reservoir of goodwill, or sense of goodwill, or feeling toward the example and the the, the example of the United States, and one wonders where and how we went wrong to where the United States seems now to have gotten itself irrevocably into a position of respecting only oligarchic and stable right-wing governments almost around the world. And how has it been that we've gotten ourselves into that position and unable somehow at a policy level or at a philosophical level, political leadership level, with some system that allows us to relate in some manner or means to the aspirations and the needs of the vast majority of the masses of the people of this planet.
where have we gone wrong and is that a major problem we don't have a political philosophy that allows us to relate to the needs of the underclasses of the world i think that's been from the beginning and i would take issue when you say that we had our own revolutionary tradition mm -hmm. i would say and i think the evidence is overwhelming that the framers of the constitution the founding fathers were this oligarchy we're talking about in other countries mm -hmm. and if they started out as an elite governing body which they were they were the bankers, the merchants, the landowners, the lawyers, the slaveholders of colonial society. They were the people with the money, in other words, and they wrote the Constitution to preserve and enhance their own private wealth. Mm. They were scared to death of democracy. Mm. And there's evidence after evidence. I refer you to, and all the viewers, to uh, a recent book just out a couple of months ago, published by South End Press. It is called Toward an American Revolution. Mm -hmm. And the author is a professor whose name is Jerry Frizia, and he takes Charles Beard's earlier yeah. analyses and much further applying them to today. Mm -hmm. And I think, that, well, when I go to university speaking, and I've spoken at more than 100 places uh, in the last year and a half, I say that that may be the best $10 that any student could ever spend mm -hmm. during four years of education. Okay. Because it explodes the myth, as irreverent as that may be for us Americans, mm -hmm. explodes the myth of the grandeur of the Constitution mm -hmm. and of the Founding Fathers because they were looking at them after themselves, they were scared to death of democracy, of real democracy, and they wrote out of the political process completely all of the indentured laborers, all the men without property, all the Native, Native Americans, they were savages, all the blacks, most of them were slaves, mm -hmm. and all of the women. Well, the, and they started the Constitution, we yeah. the people of the United States, yes, indeed, and yeah. they were less than 10% right. of the people. Right, right, right. Well, right. Yeah. They democracy was a new idea <coughs> in a certain sense in the political frame. Yes, but it hasn't changed that much, I don't think. Yeah. You know what we have in the United States today? What do we, we have? We have 2% of the families in this country owning 54% of the net financial assets yes, I of know. the United Very States. Yes, I 5% virtually on well, all. Well, I used to mm. think that uh, the, uh, the concentration of wealth and income in Latin America was a scandal mm -hmm. until I began to see what it was in the States, and that figure of 2% owning 54% yes. is not something out of the air. That no, no, comes no, from the Catholic bishops' uh, pastoral and, on the economy. And the trending is that it becomes more and more concentrated as you and I sit here and talk. Well, we've just seen in recent days that mm. during the eight years of Reaganism, Mm -hmm. The rich people in the United States have gotten a whole lot richer, mm -hmm. and the poor people have gotten a whole lot poorer. Mm -hmm. And that is why I say that we've never been revolutionary. Mm -hmm. We've never had the masses of the population under consideration, really. Mm -hmm. It's been stabilizing the situation, keeping them under control, mm -hmm. having escape valves so that poor people can get rich mm -hmm. if they're very lucky. But it means that one in three Americans mm -hmm. do not have the slightest chance or hope of ever realizing the American dream. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One in three Americans is illiterate, mm -hmm. either totally, really? or, or yeah. one in three it's yeah. that high, yeah. either totally or to the degree that they cannot function in a society based on the written word, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. such as street signs, yeah, for example. Right, 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 right. Uh, read uh, yeah. read uh, Illiteracy in, in America. This, in the, yeah, Jonathan Cole. Uh, exactly. Kozel, yeah. in, in, Kozel. In, in a country that is as wealthy as this one is. Yeah. It's a disgrace, absolute uh -huh. disgrace. Uh -huh. So the people who might be very uh, sanguine or saying uh, Spigia Brzezinski, others saying that uh, peace through strength, uh, the capitalism is winning out, the Soviet system is in disarray, socialist systems are in disarray, and people who are celebrating almost arrogantly in many cases the success and the forever ongoing leadership position of the capitalist market economies are well, ill-advised in terms of, uh, in your estimation, <laughs> in terms of the prospects for our planet. Uh, well, uh, I think that if a lot of changes, of saying, course. Yeah, and the in my, is running uh, so I, I, I very, believe very strongly that the CIA's support to torture abroad, the institutionalization of torture in country after country around the world, the support to the security services that repress and murder their own people, to the death squads, this very nasty and grisly activity along with all the other things that the CIA does abroad, the subversion of democratic institutions, the overthrow of democratically elected civilian governments and the replacement with military dictatorships of a neo-fascist stripe, all those activities proceed from our domestic system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I was a CIA, I, a CIA trainee, I was taught that the, the Soviet foreign policy, expansionism, belligerence, and so forth, was a direct product of their internal system. Yeah. That is, the requirements of the 
Communist Party of the Soviet Union to maintain a monopoly on power. Yeah. Well, I think any political science, scientist would agree. A nation's domestic system determines its foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And if we have elite control in this country, control by people who come from those 2% of the families that own 54% of the wealth, mm -hmm. then those people are defining the national security. And they're defining it in their own interests, mm -hmm. just as the framers of the Constitution wrote the document in their own interests. Uh -huh. And they wrote it because they wanted to have the people who own the United States govern the United States. How do we deal and with we still have that situation. Uh, and again, we, we talk specifics about the book. How, how do we deal with that kind of a situation as far as the United States is concerned in your estimation? Is the political process of trying to find a meaningful reform or transformation through the mainline political parties? Or how do we do it? Do we need political leadership? Or what is Absolutely. The, what is the... Uh, path that you could well, see. Well, of course, I see the Rainbow uh, Coalition, that movement, as very, very positive because it is widening, widening the political debate. Yeah. It is bringing concepts such as economic violence into the mainstream, whereas up until now, these concepts were fringe, practically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think that that's an extremely important movement. And uh, when I see the weakening of the CIA as a very important element I see it as an element which will help liberate other people because the struggle of the people of Nicaragua is our struggle. Mm -hmm. Every victory of the Nicaraguans, the Cubans also, mm -hmm. is our victory because that weakens the, the imperial project begun more than 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it means our own changes and liberation in this country are that much easier. It's That's why it's very important to be in solidarity and to yeah. work with those people. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult for Americans to be able to start thinking about, if you say liberation movements of people, third world peoples and so forth, what they're going to liberate themselves from in many, many instances is the hegemony of the United States of America. Absolutely. And the United States of America becomes the bastion of conservative reactionary power, or in other words, in a certain sense, the enemy in the minds of increasing numbers of people, particularly in the developing world. They have that view of the United States. That's something that's a very little hard for Americans mm -hmm. to swallow mm -hmm. when they like to think about this as being the fount of wisdom and, uh, and, and all good things in this world. Yeah, well, if the you understand what I'm saying. Absolutely. And the symbolism is in the flag. Mm -hmm. As if we're one nation, undivided, with liberty and justice for all. Mm -hmm. Whereas in actual fact, that symbolism covers what is basically a fractured society. Mm -hmm. And when you speak of the United States in the interest of the United States, it's not all the people of the United States. No. It's those very few who run and control the United States. These activities of the CIA abroad, which I've been discuss discussing, are in the interests of those few people. The CIA, when it supports death squads, is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Because the CIA doesn't have its own policy. It is told what to do by the President of the United States. It's his instrument. Mm -hmm. And he uses it as he, wi he wishes. Of course, he tries to deny certain things and keep a distance, like Reagan did, from all of the um, Oliver North stuff. Yeah. But in actual fact, the CIA does not have its own policy. And for that reason, it is told to do things that are interest in the interest of not the vast majority of Americans, not yours, not mine, but in the interests of just a few people whose wealth is based on the operations of American companies in countries around the world. Mm -hmm. So when Brzezinski or someone else talks about America, yeah. that is a typical um, figure of speech used to make it look as if we all have common interest. Yeah. When in actual fact, we don't at all. Mm -hmm. There is no way you can divide national security in this country which would be in the interest of all the people. That's why it's so important to think in terms of breaking the imperial project begun a long time ago, that is, as it manifested abroad, mm -hmm. and also within the United States to create a real democracy, mm -hmm. a government which serves the interests of all the people and not just the priorities of very few. Each person can have a vote in this country where they can vote in election. Less than 50% do. We do it to that degree then have, in a certain sense, an, a political democracy in that there are these party systems allowed and so forth. Economically, we're very much of a plutocracy. I mean, the ownership, as you point out, 5% owning 54, 2% owning 54%, and 5% virtually perhaps owning it all. Most people only have a wage relationship to production and so forth. It gives us a, 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 a problem in terms of, of that broad perspective of how we can see some sort of a, of a, of a, of a transformation. But we, we have this kind of a situation now, and one wonders uh, w how are, in your estimation, uh, you, you have 60 to 65 percent of the population vote Mr. Reagan, who ha was in a very real sense reactionary, both domestic and on an international scale. 
most popular president to leave the presidency and blow these many decades? And how do we explain the fact that there are so many people who are in support of him and what was going on, even though it was acting against the uh, interests of many of the people of our country and, and the world? Mm -hmm. I mean, is it a well, matter of the <coughs> media? Is it a matter of, do you understand? Well, yes, uh, well, I'll give you an example. Uh, this illustrates the problem and the solution. A recent poll a few months ago uh, was taken on Americans' attitudes toward El Salvador, yeah. toward the government of El Salvador. And you know, this is the Duarte government. It's the one that's received three and a half billion dollars, yeah. million and a half dollars a day, which exceeds the national budget. It has been heralded from years now as the showcase of the restoration of what they call democracy in Central America. Mm -hmm. Americans ought to know something about the government of, of El Salvador. Yeah. All right, what the result? 15% only, 15% of Americans, according to the poll, which was taken by a professional pollster uh, organization in Detroit, only 15% of Americans believe that El Salvador has a democratic government. 33% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. of Americans, according to the poll, don't have the slightest idea what kind of government El Salvador has. Yeah. But then the revelation, 35% of Americans think that El Salvador has a pro-Soviet government. Good Lord. Yeah. Now, they didn't say what the other 17% thought, but it doesn't surprise me if they have Duarte confused with Khomeini and think that there's an Islamic fundamentalist government in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. it's, it's ignorance. Uh -huh. It's apathy. It's lack of uh, interest, really, mm -hmm. that keeps Americans uh, Ma uh, badly informed, it's and becoming that's worse, the problem. Becoming worse yeah, well, of course, it's the schools. Every every uh, every survey of Americans' ability in mathematics and geography and uh, you name it, practically, yeah, it's uh, it's shocking because mm -hmm. I'm over in Europe where people are really being educated, yeah. and where children, uh, that is young people, are paid to go to university. Uh -huh. <clears throat> they don't have to mortgage the um, the farm to go to university. They get a stipend from the government because those governments realize that the future is in the youth. Yeah, right. And they should be given every opportunity to have an education. And here but we do not. Yeah, and they have the <coughs> self-serving kind of thing, and the United States is going in this direction. You're also in touch from Spain, and uh, you were in Spain partly because it was a little bit difficult for you to be here. People thought you were subversive or something of that sort of thing, but no. you had to, you had to, I mean, the people in <coughs> the government were seeing you for having well, it's a long, had some difficulty yeah, it's a very long story. I had terrible difficulties. It's in this book, in fact. Right, let's let uh, people know that right now. Maybe you could come in tight. Let's show that. Philip Agee. This is the latest one. It's called On the Run. Just out now. Stuart, uh, Lyle uh, Stewart. It, right? it came out a year and a half ago, yes. Okay, yeah. So you've got that in there, this thing about the, your... That's the whole story of the last 20 years of my life since right. I left the CIA. Uh -huh. it's, the whole, it's a whole series of adventure stories about how they followed me around in the streets. The CIA knew I was writing my first book. Yeah. It's the early 70s. Uh -huh. They followed me around in the streets, these teams of people in Paris and in London and Madrid, and I went underground in Paris. Yeah. Uh, a couple of young Americans befriended <coughs> me, and uh, they gave me money when I had no money for food. Yeah, I was destitute, uh -huh. trying right, to get right. the book done. Yeah. They gave me a typewriter when I had no typewriter to work with. Right, right. And uh, it turned out that by chance I discovered inside the typewriter a radio transmitter secretly hidden in the case of the typewriter, oh which allowed CIA people to locate the secret place I was living underground. Mm -hmm. And I caught the, uh, the monitors the minute they caught me. Uh -huh. It was a very emotional scene. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah. And then I went on um, to finish my book, and it also includes the stories about how I was expelled from Britain, how I was jailed and put in prison in Germany and then expelled, kidnapped in France, <laughs> and expelled, uh, expelled from Holland, from Italy, not allowed to enter Norway. I mean, it was just going on for several years. Sorry you had to go through all of that. Well, you know, I, I, I expected, you know, yeah, I expected yeah. retaliation. Because you had been saying some things about the CIA and the system of American... Uh, We've driven them crazy. That, uh, I, not just I. I mean, they always like to focus on me, but in fact there is a hundreds of people John involved. Stockwell, well, John uh, eventually course. came along in yeah. this, um, this anti-CIA uh, campaign, and there were journalists of every sort all over Europe, and in fact, all over the world, yeah. who were working on exposing the CIA in their own countries. Mm -hmm. That is, the operations and the people that do it, because those are the two factors that are most important in weakening the CIA as an instrument for political repression or for subversion of democratic institutions. It's in, it's, in our it's, in, it's in our interest to try and weaken the instruments of our foreign policy in a certain sense. Uh, well, the policy hasn't yeah. changed. Right, right. Policy has been the same since Truman. Mm -hmm. And if there were justice in this world, mm -hmm. Truman and every president since him would be in prison mm -hmm. or would have ended up behind bars. Mm -hmm. Because Article 6, I think it is, of the Constitution says mm -hmm. that treaties will be the supreme law of the land mm -hmm. when signed by the president and ratified by the Senate. Yeah. And we have violated treaties constantly every single day since 1947. Yeah. And so that alone, not 
uh, not to mention a lot of other things, mm -hmm. would, should have brought these presidents behind bars. Mm -hmm. And Reagan himself yeah. should very well be, have been impeached mm -hmm. because of the Iran-Contra affair. But the powers that be in this country did not want another constitutional crisis mm, or a idea. crisis of legitimacy mm. that calls into question the whole system. Yeah, one wonders if they're able to just do that so cavalierly without there being, I mean, the North trial is on now and whether or not the whole story is written on that. One wonders if there is likely to be any, uh, on tour, any action brought again or any, uh, you know, involvement of Mr. Reagan, Mr. Bush, or any of the others who might have been involved with drug smuggling and all kinds of things that were coming out of Central America. It's incredible. They, it's incredible. You know, we've had some criminals in the White House, but they became criminals after they got in. Yeah. This one is a criminal before he even got into the White House. Uh, and you know why? Mr. Bush. Yes. Mm. The reason is that an illegal contra resupply operation at a time when the Congress had cut off the money mm -hmm. and it was fa that was financed by the cocaine barons of Colombia mm -hmm. was run out of Bush's office mm -hmm. during 1983, 84, and 85. That's established it's and clear and Of course, it's been in all the newspapers. Right? Now, you how, put can it all like that, how can something like that go on without there being... I mean, uh, what, is the, what are we to think when something like that could go on and the man still serves in the office? Because nobody wants before. another crisis like they had with Nixon and Watergate. Mm -hmm. An impeachment process just uh, makes the, the ruling elite in this country quake uh -huh. because it brings the system into uh, question mm -hmm. and uh, the legitimacy, I mean. And we have a rules of the game in this country, political rules of the game, established by the Constitution, which keep the debate very narrow. Mm -hmm. And the Constitution, these rules, are very hard to change. Mm -hmm. What it does, really, is create the situation in when we go out and vote Republican or Democratic, we are basically making a choice between, on the one hand, Tweedledee, and on the other, Tweedledum. Mm -hmm. Because you can imagine a m much different scheme of government which would serve people where you wouldn't have homeless, you wouldn't have illiterate, you wouldn't have people who are f hungry. We have the means to create that society. Mm -hmm. But under these rules of the game, we can't do it. Mm -hmm. under the it rules doesn't happen. We have the, not only the, our own society, but the world in a very real sense. I was asking before, you're in Spain, and the, the vision of the United States of America among the peoples, Asia, Africa, and Latin America, is it, uh, the, the vision of the United States of America is in decline in the minds Absolutely of not. the masses of the people? No. no, there's a distinction in anybody who's politically aware, yeah. in his mind or her mind, between the government yeah. and the people who run the United States, mm -hmm. the economic forces behind the government, mm -hmm and the people of the United States. I have had the most marvelous reception everywhere I've gone mm -hmm. from ordinary people yeah. because they know that I am not part of that ruling elite or clique, not part of political repression anymore, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So my receptions have been fantastic mm -hmm. and people know that there is a difference. They know that there are Americans at work every day in this country to try to change the system, to work in solidarity with the people of El Salvador, or with Nicaragua, or with Cuba, or with Grenada, mm -hmm. even now, but much more so before the collapse of the revolution there, and with peoples all over the world who are trying to change the system. Mm -hmm. They are trying to break the control of generations of these so-called 14 families in El Salvador, mm -hmm. or the oligarchies uh, elsewhere the in America. The oligarchies of the world. Of the world. Yeah. But we have to do that here, too. Uh -huh. We could take a lesson from them, and one of the points I try to make to all the students I talk to is that they should look to the students of El Salvador right now for an example mm -hmm. because those students of El Salvador are going out on the streets constantly they are laying their life on the line every day for what they believe in mm -hmm. to create a just and better society for everybody just as the Nicaraguans have created a revolution in the name of the poor of that yeah. country uh, yeah. and the oppressed. I guess what I was saying, the masses of the people of the world are less inclined towards seeing the United States in favorable terms than they have. We're losing ground among the masses of the people of the world, the yeah, United States official. of America, the official capacity mm -hmm. representation of the United States yeah. of America. That's right, because people see that the, I mean, it's true, the official uh, acceptance or let's say the acceptance of official policies in the United States, meaning whatever comes out of the government, yeah. is certainly in decline, absolutely, mm -hmm. all over the place. Uh -huh. But people there know, they know perfectly well that there is a whole movement going on in this country for change, uh -huh. and it may be weak, it may be small, it may not be as strong now as the one issue, like end of the Vietnam War, yeah, that kind yeah, of thing, right, right, right. but that there are Americans working on it, and um, uh, so America is basically 
admired and loved by people all over the world. Mm -hmm. For the popular culture, for example, yeah. for the diversity, yeah. for the uh, spontaneity, for the civil liberties, yeah. for things like that. Yeah. But what they don't like are nuclear, nuclear weapons, okay. militarism, trying to crush one of the poorest countries in the world, Nicaragua. Terrorist CIA activity? Absolutely. Yeah. That is what turns more people against the United States than than you can imagine. Uh -huh. And more and more people ought to understand that that's the position that we have. We really do need some sort of a philosophy, political philosophy or vision that allows us to relate to the needs of uh, underclass, poor people of the, not only of the world, but also of our nation. I mean, we have uh, streets filled with homeless and that sort of thing. We really do need that, uh, that does not seem to come out of the mainstream political, um, the political dialogue. Oh, we try a to vision that them. relates <coughs> to that, uh, Need on a, on a third, and that's part of a, a part of a national uh, strength, as it were, in terms of the in the most real realpolitik mm -hmm. kind of terms. <laughs> we do need that kind of vision, and we lack it. I mean, the United States of America does in its tradition. Our problem is that elitist view that we've been talking about. But what we do in the United States is we we allow, or officially we allow these people to be neutralized mm -hmm. so that they're not a political threat. There was no demand for crack in 1980, 81, mm -hmm. because there was practically, there was no such thing right. as crack practically. Right. Right. This was invented, and uh, the demand was invented. Mm -hmm. You hear this talk about stopping the demand side rather yeah. than the source yeah. side. Well, in actual fact, this crack ep epidemic in the United States right now raises some interesting questions. For example, isn't there some kind of political dividend that for every ghetto youth who gets on crack, or gets addicted to some other drug, is one potential political activist less mm -hmm. who has everything to gain <coughs> by radical change in this country. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is a whole generation. There are millions of kids who yeah. are being turned on to crack and off to politics. Yeah, and particularly when you see that the government at the highest levels have been involved in the bringing of drugs into this country. Exactly. Knowingly. It That's makes right. it just seem almost uh, so, uh, a question that uh, the, the, the realities of the situation uh, have to be called into question, and it seems to me, if I may, your work and your books and your activity and so forth has been one of the leading people who are bringing us a new kind of vision, a different kind of vision. You did it at a considerable personal uh, discomfort to yourself and so forth, and I want to just thank you personally for all your work all right, over yeah, the thanks. years and so forth. Mm -hmm. And of thank course the much. book, let me show it once again, On the Run, Philip Agee, and he's, it, uh, it's five books now that you've written over the, yes. the longer haul, and he keeps working <coughs> uh, on these issues, and it's been your pleasure. I want to thank you for that, and particularly for participating in conversations here. Thank you very much for the in invitation. Interesting series that we've got, interesting conference that we have here. What is it, uh, the uh, Socialist Scholars Conference here in New York <coughs> City, is it where we are now talking, and uh, I want to again thank you very much, Philip Agee. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to be with you. Okay, fine. It's your pleasure, if I could say, then, of course, Ben Philip Agee, your pleasure to have these perceptions. We'll be uh, doing more next week from this conference uh, at the uh, at the uh, Socialist, People, uh, Socialist uh, Scholars Conference in New York. That's it for this particular segment. Uh, we'll see you again next week, Philip. Once again, thank you very much indeed. Good night. We'll see you next week. stopping the demand side rather yeah. than the source yeah. side. Well, in actual fact, this crack ep epidemic in the United States right now raises some interesting questions. For example, isn't there some kind of political dividend that for every ghetto youth who gets on crack or gets addicted to some other drug 
is one potential political activist less mm -hmm. who has everything to gain <coughs> by radical change in this country. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is a whole generation. There are millions of kids who yeah. are being turned on to crack and off to politics. Yeah, and particularly when you see that the government at the highest levels have been involved in the bringing of drugs into this country. Exactly. Knowingly. It That's makes right. it just seem almost uh, so a, a question that uh, the, the, the realities of the situation uh, have to be called into question. And it seems to me, if I may, your work and your books and your activity and so forth has been one of the leading people who are bringing us a new kind of vision, a different kind of vision. You did it a considerable personal uh, discomfort to yourself and so forth, and I want to just thank you personally for all your work right, over the think. years and so forth. Mm -hmm, and of course, the much. book, let me show it once again, On the Run, Phil of Aging, he's, it, uh, it's five books now that you've written over the, yes. the longer haul, and he keeps working mm -hmm. uh, on these issues, and it's been your pleasure. I want to thank you for that, and particularly for participating in conversations here. Thank you very much for the it, invitation. Interesting series that we've got, interesting conference that we have here. What is it? Uh, the uh, Socialist Scholars Conference here in New York <coughs> City, that where we are now talking, and uh, I want to again thank you very much, Phil of Aging. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to be with you. Okay, fine. It's your pleasure, if I could say, then, of course, Ben Philip Agee, your pleasure to have these perceptions. We'll be uh, doing more next week from this conference uh, at the, uh, at the uh, Socialist, People, uh, Socialist uh, Scholars Conference in New York. That's it for this particular segment. Uh, we'll see you again next week, Philip. Once again, thank you very much indeed. Good night. We'll see you next week. Okay.